Welcome back to another Golang tutorial. I know it's been a while, but today we're going to look at another Golang code base and give you some insights on how to build applications in Go. So this is a little game that I wrote a while ago. It's very basic, but as you can see, I have kind of a player that I can move and I can collect items which are these dollar symbols and that's actually my goal to collect them and then there are those enemies these X symbols which are spawning randomly and they are moving to actually stop me from collecting items so I have to evade them if I run into them, then they will kill me and it's game over. So I have to be careful here, as you can see. So it's getting more and more enemies and I have to be more and more careful that I don't run into one of those. So but just to show you what happens, let's run into one by accident. And yeah, it's game over, you died. I can see I got uh, eight points, which means um, I gathered eight items and now I can either quit or restart the game. So it's very basic, but it's a game after all, you can play it. And in this tutorial, we're going to look at how the code for that looks like, how you can build that yourself. And I can already give you a small uh, preview. Here's the code base and it's actually not that much so when you scroll down yeah, it's really just a few functions and in the end even with all that um, controlling of the player and the movement of the enemies it's just a bit about over 300 lines of code so and it's normally formatted so it's not that much after all so stay tuned if you want to know how to build this and expand your Golang knowledge. Okay, so we have to start small. And as usual, I like to do the Hello World example first. So let's actually just do this and print Hello World on the screen before we move on to the bigger topics like uh, moving player and enemies and items to collect and things like that. So the basic program is uh, this and don't feel intimidated by it. Let's look at it step by step. We're going to look at our main function first. So the main function is where our program starts and go. And we basically have just three steps in here when you look at it from this perspective. We have a model, you can see it here, which encapsulates our data. In this simple case, it's just the text that we want to print like hello world here. Um, let's look at this in more detail later. Well, then we have a program, which is created by a library that we're using. We're actually using the amazing bubble tea library. I'm going to put a link in the video description that is for building command line interface tools in Go. So it makes a few things easier for us, especially then when we are going to draw some things on the screen and not just print text, because printing text is also easily possible without any external libraries. And now that we have created this program here, you can see we are passing the model and we are saying with old screen, that just means go into full screen mode. We don't want this console where you still have a blinking cursor and something to put in. We want the full screen. We run this program and then this bubble tea library will internally uh, run a game. In our case, it's a game in a loop where it's going to update the model. Uh, watch for input events like when you press a key on your mouse or keyboard and draw your uh, elements on the screen. We're going to look at this next. But those are the high level steps. 
So let's look at our model. You can see here at the top, I imported this bubble tea library and that's the only external library that we are going to need in this tutorial because it makes things easier. The other two are standard Go libraries. Our model is just a container for our data. So maybe your player has a name, maybe your player has a position or something like that. You want to encapsulate this data in some data structure. Fairly standard way in Go is to use a struct. So I just called it model here. It's a struct and it has a text string, which is what we are going to print on the screen in this very basic first step. Uh, what else do we need? Um, let's ignore this init function here for now. Um, it's just for some initial setup work. Uh, we don't really need it here, but you have to implement it. It's for an interface that the bubble tea library expects. We're returning nil, which is basically an, a pointer that is pointing to nothing to signal we got nothing to do here. More interesting is the update function. So update is actually called each time when something happens. So when you press a key on the keyboard, for example, while the program is run, then the bubble T library will call this update function. So we can react to this key press. Um, now we got the message, which is here, this parameter. And we can ask the message, hey, are you a key message? And which key are you? So we want to have an option to uh, exit the program, right? So as you can see here, I can type in something, some characters and nothing happens because we are in a full screen. It's intended to be a full application like a console game. Um, so nothing happens unless I press those keys that we defined here to actually quit the program. So t.quit is the signal to stop the program. And you can see I'm querying for control C, which is typical on the console, or Q for quitting. So I'm going to press Q now. And as you can see, my program was terminated. I can start it again. See the text now this time, control C, and I'm out again. Okay. So that's usually what we want to make sure that there's some normal way for the user to exit. And we're going to extend this further when we are building some interactions into our game. And now let's look at the other interesting method, which is view. And view is for actual rendering. So printing on the screen what we want to show. It's basically a representation of our current model state. And it's very basic in Bubble T. You're just returning a string because a string is easy to uh, imagine and easy to print on the screen. So this is very basic here. We just need to return the text that we configured in our model. It's hello world here. Um, that will be called by Bubble T. So that was basically it. It's not that complicated. We got our model um, and those three methods are basically what you need to get it running with bubble T. So an init method, an update method and a view method. If you're familiar with Go, you know that those are methods and not functions. That's because you have a receiver type here. I marked it for update. And that is basically, it means run this method on this object like a model. So we create the model here and then the method will both get the message like the key we pressed or something else that was done by the user like input. And we also have access to the model here. It's a pointer so we can actually read and write our model, which we're going to do in the next steps. Okay. Now just to show you um, that view is actually queried to print our model. 
Let's change this to um, Hello Golang Tutorial and save. And you can see the model was changed. Um, the library is calling the view method and it's printing the new string and I can still terminate the program. Okay, that was the very first basic example. Stay tuned if you want to continue with actually making it look a bit more like a game. Okay, next let's draw our playing field border. So as you can see here, it's uh, basically just a rectangle that marks the border of our playing field. So what do we have to do in order to implement that? First, let's revisit our model because our model encapsulates our data and the state. So here you can see I swapped the string text that we were printing before with a table field. And the table field is a two-dimensional array. So it's you can imagine it like a matrix or a table where you have uh, rows and columns, or like a spreadsheet maybe too. So you have rows, you have columns, and now when you have a, a row number and a column number both together, you can address a specific cell like in a spreadsheet. So programmers call those indexes. And then there's the table height and the table width, uh, which says how many rows, how many columns do we have. And inside this table, we have cells that contain runes. Rune is basically a symbol uh, type in Go. So you can imagine it a bit like um, there's a single symbol in each cell. And you can see the runes that I defined here. So we have a vertical line rune, which is just this uh, here between the um, between the ticks, this line, and then there's a horizontal line, and empty is just here a blank. So I just filled in the blank here, and the corner is a simple plus sign to just connect vertical and horizontal lines. So I defined those as constants because we're going to reference them multiple times, and that's always a good thing to extract constants is usually a good programming practice. And now table width and table height are also constants. I just defined them as 62 and 32. You can see it here. That's basically the number of rows and columns in this terminal. And um, yeah, I added plus two here explicitly to have the space reserved for the borders. So we actually have 60 where something else can move or be, and 30 in height. So that's our data model. Now we need to create an instance of this model, and therefore I created this constructor function. It's basically just, just a function that is creating a new instance of our model type. So let's look at it step by step. When we create a new model for our game, um, you have the zero value in every cell of your two-dimensional array here, which I called table. And zero value is a concept in Go. I'm not sure if I've explained it before, but it's basically a default value that uh, variable of a certain type has when you don't assign anything. For a string, for example, it's the empty string, so there's nothing in there. For an integer, it's zero, unless you assign something else. And for runes, it's um, basically the empty rune, and that's the, the zero value, value zero. And as you can see here, my 
explanatory comment. It's based on integer. So behind that is an integer, but this integer represents a symbol. And by default, it's zero, which we are going to interpret as just empty. So that's why I defined our constant here above. But you will see it later. It makes more sense when you put it into practice. So first, I'm going to set the four corners here. And you have to imagine this table. Um, we start at the top left. And the first index is basically the row. And when you increase that index, we go further down the row. And the second index that you can see here is it's inside um, the column. So index zero, zero is basically in the top left. Then there is zero and the last index is table with minus one because as programmers, we usually in most languages start at index zero and we end at with minus one. So that is at the top right corner, this direction. Then there is the uh, bottom left corner and the bottom right corner here. Then we got the corners. So as you can see here, when I'm uh, adding those lines, we get the lines too. So it's not that complicated actually when you understand indexes and loops. You can go down the columns and draw the first column line at index zero. Uh, so first row until last row. And the same, uh, actually those are the horizontal borders. Those are the, here are the vertical borders like left and right borders and those are the top and bottom borders. Okay, and then we got our initial model. So then you have inside this two-dimensional array, you have a representation of these symbols. Most of them are just empty here. The, the zero value is, a, we're going to use that for printing, but inside there is a zero because it's based on int. And um, those are just the the corners and the vertical and horizontal border. So we can use this new model function to create our initial model. And then there's just one more thing that we need, which is the uh, rendering. So the printing on the screen of the model. Our update and init function are exactly the same like before. Nothing changed here. Now view is more interesting because we actually have to iterate our table here, our two-dimensional array, to print on the screen. Um, otherwise, nothing will happen. So the first loop here is iterating over the rows, so from top to bottom of the table. And the second one is going from left to right. So that's how we can fill all the cells. And here's the interesting part now. If a cell is zero, which means we haven't set anything, it's the, the default, the zero value from a go, go room type, then we're going to print the empty room, which is, um, as we've seen here, it's just a blank. So an empty square. And if there's not the zero value, then we're going to print what is actually uh, in the cell. And those are the borders that we set. And we have to remember that um, after each row has been completed, we have to add a new line to the string. So it's actually switching lines, otherwise it would be on one very long string. And that's about it. So this is already rendering us this uh, border. And just to make it a bit more clear, you 
can see here, let's say we are going to um, Mm, that's you could for example change the size so let's change the size first let's say you want a width of uh, 80 not 880 and table height 40 and you can see it's already bigger than my my terminal I can show you without scrolling so let's say Table height 65. Now it's already bigger. Another shot. Let's try 60. Oh, it's a bit too high. Then let's make it smaller. Let's say we're going to pick 20 and 40 plus the two additional rows and columns for the border. Okay, height is actually what is uh, too high. So let's go 30 and 60. Yeah, okay. Um, what else? Well, you could actually swap the symbols here if you want to. That's a good thing of constants. So Let's say instead of a vertical line, we want this um, hashtag here. And you can see it's drawing it in a different way. And now let's see what happens when we actually remove the horizontal borders. So let's put this in comments so it's not active and restart our game so you can see it's just drawing the vertical ones okay next we are going to see how we can actually have a player on the screen and something that we can move so it's actually becoming a game okay next step is to actually have a player and you can see here, I have a circle that is my player and that I can move around when I'm pressing the arrow keys on my keyboard. So let's see how we can add this to our program. First, you can see that I added a player symbol here, which is just this. Yeah, I guess I chose a small O symbol to represent our player. Then again, we have to think about our model. And you can see here I added two integer fields to our model, which is the current row and column index of my player. So when we move around on the screen, we have to remember where we are, because then when the user presses another arrow key, we have to calculate from there in which direction to move and update our current position. So that's pretty obvious, right? Um, now, before we go into the moving details, let's look at our um, new model function, which is initially just to create our model in the beginning when we start the program. Um, all those things above here, drawing of the border, you already know that from earlier. Um, I just added this part here. So player row and player column is at position one and one. So we spawn our player near the top left corner. And in addition to this position, we also need to set the player symbol in our two dimensional array. So the table field player row, player column gets those this uh, rune symbol of the player assigned so we can print it with our view function without any further changes. So we can change that just to show you the effect, let's say 10, 10, and then we're going to spawn not in the top left corner, but near that like this. 
Well, so that's our starting position. What else do we need? Obviously, we have our update method and I extended it here because now we want to react to arrow key presses. And that's pretty simple with bubble T. You can just check if the key message that we received is an up, down, left or right. And depending on which key was pressed, I'm calling a method player up, player down, player left, player right that we are going to look at next. But that's it about reacting in the first place. Now player up, let's look at the player up method. You can see it here. Um, basically all those methods are just a movement in one direction, right? I put that in the move function here. You can see it at the top. Uh, it's a method actually, so it's defined as a point on the model so we can change it. Row and column are integers and they are basically saying this is your new position coordinates in the table row index column index. So what do we need to do? First in the table we need to mark our old position as cleared. We are no longer there. So we can pick this still from our model. Row and cal are the new coordinates. So we pick the old ones since we haven't updated them yet from the model m.player row and m.player call the ones here. Set it to zero, which remember is the zero value for runes and we just print that as a blank on the screen like an empty cell. Then we are setting the new player location. So player is now at this location in our table. And then player row and player call are finally uh, set to our new location. So that's pretty easy. And player up is calling move with row minus one, because remember we start counting indexes for the rows at the top. So this is row zero, then row one, row two. And when I press up, I go from maybe row two to row one, from row one to row zero and so on. So here I pass the current row minus one and the column doesn't change because I'm moving in the top direction, like vertically. So for down, it's the opposite, it's plus one and for left, we leave the row unchanged and say uh, column minus one and for right it's the inverse column plus one. It's pretty straightforward. Now there's one thing we have to remember. We have this border, right? So we have to check are we right next to the border and trying to move beyond it? Then we don't do anything because our player is not able to cross the end of the playing field. So we check, is the player row one or less? That means we are already here at the topmost row because it's number one, the number one row, zero is the index of the border. So we refuse, now I'm pressing the up button, we refuse to go further, we do nothing, we return from the method. Move is not called, coordinates are not updated, and so on. And that's what we need to do similarly for the other directions. So for player down, we have to check if our player row is, um, yeah, actually at the table height, minus two. Minus two is because of the borders, we have to count them in. And for the left border, it's again, uh, one is the last or the smallest column that we can actually move our player and on the right side we have to see if we are already at table with minus two then that is um, the last 
column that we can move to. And as you can see, I can test it here. I can move to each border and to each um, corner, but it's not going any further. So that's about it. All the other stuff is unchanged. So printing our view is unchanged and uh, also the init function, we don't really need it here. Uh, we're creating our model with our new model constructor function here. Okay, in the next step, we are going to make it a bit more engaging. Engaging means we actually have an item that spawns. You can see it in the bottom right, this dollar symbol. And you can pick it up by just running into it. And then a new one will spawn randomly. And we can go there to collect it too. That's already a very, very simple game, right? So it's not very challenging because there are no enemies. But there's some dynamic aspect in it, like you don't really know where the next item will appear. So let's see how we can do that. Going to the source code, uh, we can see that I defined a new symbol for our item, which is the dollar symbol here. So we can refer to it in other places. Then similar to our player uh, coordinates, we need to know where is the item. So we not just have the player row and player column, but we also have item row and item column. But for integers, um, row is the first dimension of our table array and call the second one. Next, we also need to be able to spawn items. So those are kind of random spawning. So how do we do that? It's not that difficult. Um, I have a helper function here, which is random coordinates. You basically call it and and then it's going to return you a random row and random column. And it's already respecting the borders. So as you can see here, I'm calling this random integer function. It's int n. It's a standard go function, which um, I imported here, math random. You can read about it in the standard documentation and it's basically giving you a random integer between zero and the integer that you passed exclusive so let's say you want to simulate a dice uh, then you would call random int n from zero till six including so six plus one seven that would be for a dice roll then you get actually you get zero zero till six but you want one to six so you would add plus one and here you would reduce that to six so that means give me a random integer between zero and five, including five, add one. So we actually have a dice value between one and six. But back to our playing field, we pass the table height minus two to exclude the two border rows. And then we add plus one to make sure it's not spawning it cannot spawn where the border is. So it's an offset which sets it uh, one further down. And the same with the column. Um, what it does not do, it does not check if in this location there's already something else. So 
That's something that we still need to do, but it's already avoiding the borders. So let's look at spawn item again. We're actually calling random coordinates to get random row and column index. And then, as I said, we have to check that the cell that we basically just determined randomly that it's not already filled with, say, our player, then it would be kind of useless to uh, get the item immediately or later an enemy. So that's what this loop is for. It's actually checking that our table with the random coordinates is empty. And here, if it's not empty, if it doesn't have this zero value, the empty rune, the blank, then we're just repeating it until we find an empty space. So that's all the magic. And then once we have an empty cell, we can assign the item symbol to our table for printing our model. And we remember the current uh, row and column of our item. That's about it now. Where do we call this spawn item? Well, obviously, when we start the game, we need to call it initially. So I actually have an item. And then when I run into it, I basically collected it, then I need to call it again. So it's spawning a new one. Those are the two uh, places where we need to do that. So let's see, uh, spawn. Here, move player. Remember the move player function? It's called by player up, player down, left and right when we call in, uh, when we press an arrow key. And right after setting the new coordinates for a player, here we are checking if those new coordinates are the same as the current item coordinates. So row has to match the item row from our model has to match the new row of our player. And the item column has to match the new column for our player. If both match, they are basically in the same cell of the table and we have to spawn a new item. Okay, so that's all we need to do. And the old one has already been um, overwritten on the screen because our player is now located there. We already did it um, here. So that's already overwriting our old item in the table. And the other location is in our constructor function when we build our new model. You can see here drawing the border and so on. Initial player location that's unchanged. I just added spawn item at the end. So we do it initially when the game starts. And that's it. Everything else, I guess, is unchanged. And even the view function here, we are just printing what is inside the table or a blank if the cell is zero. And that's it. That's how we get here to collectible items. Already a very basic game and just a little bit about two, above 200 lines of code. Now, of course, the most interesting part now is to make it more challenging and add some enemies, which we are going to do next. So let's look at how we can include enemies. You can see here once I got the first item, there's the first enemy spawning and they are not moving yet so it's not too challenging but they are already spawning randomly and the more it gets the harder i have to take care not to run into one of them and let's simulate this i'm going to run into one of them on purpose and now we get a message player died game over 
and I can confirm that to exit the game. So how does it look like in our code base? Again, let's um, look at the new symbol here. I just picked an X. You can choose whatever you like. I just picked this as a, an easy option. And then our model got a Boolean flag, which is game over. So now that we have enemies, there's actually a way that the game can be over. So we have to detect it somehow. By default, it's false because the zero value, i.e. default value in Golang is false for Booleans. And you can see where well, we still have the player row and player column. I remove the row and column for items. And there's also not a pair of coordinates for the enemy. That is because I simplified this a bit. And actually, we already have this uh, data in our table. And it turned out that we can make it more easy this way because we have to maintain fewer fields, fewer state, and that makes it less error prone. So we need to spawn enemies similarly as we do with items. It's kind of random. So we can actually reuse this random coordinate, random free coordinates function. I haven't changed it. It's just uh, calling random coordinates and then repeating that until um, yeah, we got coordinates where there's nothing already. So we obviously we don't want to spawn an enemy where an item is because then it gets uh, impossible to actually collect it without dying. Now, what else do we need? Um, when we move our player, that is when we have to check if we ran into an enemy, right? So right in the beginning, I added the game over check. So if that flag is set, then moving is not uh, doing anything. It's just a defensive check here. We're going to get to the game over detection uh, again a bit later. So this one clear old player location is pretty uh, old stuff. You already know that. Here's where we check if we hit an enemy. So if in our table at this location, of our new row and column location, which we got as parameters, is an enemy symbol, then we ran into an enemy. enemy. And um, actually, remember that the game is over. So in our model, the flag game over is set to true and return from the method there's nothing else we should do like moving or something like that now normally this does not happen and um, then we can check if it's actually an item that we collected you can see here it has been simplified we do it for the enemy and for the item just by checking the uh, specific rune at this location in the two-dimensional array so like in a spreadsheet cell with coordinates. If there's an item, we collect that. So we need to spawn a new one. And of course, to make it more difficult, we spawn an additional enemy. So the items, they are going to be replaced by new item. But enemies, they get more and more and more. So once we have the success of collecting an item, we spawn an additional enemy and the old one stays, of course, to make it more difficult. So. Uh, you can think of it like um, reaching the next level, which is more difficult and challenging. And setting the new player location is like before, so nothing changed here. It's just that we check if we collided with an enemy or an item, and then we need to uh, react accordingly. Yeah, move player is called by all those uh, player up, player down, left, right methods and uh, nothing changed there. A new model is creating our initial model 
and that hasn't changed either. You can see here um, I'm spawning the player and I'm spawning the item, but initially there's no enemy. As you can see here, when I restarted, the first enemy appears when I collected the first item and second item will spawn another enemy, third enemy and so on. So nothing new here and um, in it is not used by us. Update has changed just a little bit and that is here the check for game over. So as we've already talked about, if we ran into an enemy, we set the game over flag to true and we need to check it here in update to make sure that you can't continue playing. So by returning t.quit, it's a signal for the bubble t library. We say that it should terminate this update loop. And um, it's basically the same like we do here. Yeah? Like when we press control C or Q and the user terminates the program, we also return the quit signal. And that's about it. There's a small addition in the view method, which is rendering our model to the screen. So we actually get some output. If the game is over, it says um, player died, game over, and then it's returning to not do anything else. So we're not just thrown out of the program without knowing what happened, and then we think it might have crashed. But we get this message, and then it actually quits. And the rest is pretty much the same. Rendering to the screen, main function, nothing changed here. So to recap, it's the spawning of the enemies, which is also random. And a bit of simplification that we added for detecting where the item and the enemy is. So, as you can see, I can already play a game that I'm actually able to lose if I'm not careful. And now let's improve this a little bit more and make it more challenging by making the enemies by themselves move too. You know, actually before making the enemies move, let's make sure that we have something like a score and uh, a bit better message at the end of the game so we can actually show the player how many items were collected. So you can see here, let me quickly collect three of them. Then I'm doing my best to run into an enemy. And now you can see the message is a bit, bit clearer aligned and I get the score free. And I have the option and not just to terminate the program, but to uh, restart it by pressing enter or Q to terminate. When I press enter, I can start the game all over again. Okay, how can we do that? Um, basically, I added, you probably already guessed it, a new field to our model, which is for the score. So we have an integer field to remember the score that we need to update each time we collect an item. Uh, where do we do that? Here. So when we move our player and we are at the same location as an item, then we're not just spawning an item in a new enemy, but we also increase the score. So in our model is score plus plus. Model is a pointer, M is a pointer to our model, so we can actually write it and not just read it. That's important to actually modify the score. And what else? Um, at the end, so here's our view function. When the game is over, then I print a string that is a bit more pretty. So here you can see I'm building a string that goes over multiple lines. There's some new lines in there to make it 
visible. And then there's your score placeholder person D is for integers. And using Go's standard print functions, you have already seen those in other tutorials of me, there's uh, the option to replace it with the score. And then we give the hand you can restart or quit. So nothing too fancy here. Um, but now we have to make sure that we're actually reacting to uh, the enter key and restarting the game. So that's what our update method is intended for. So you can see here I added, if the game is over, there's the option to, of course, quit again. But I can also press enter. And in this case, I'm just returning the model here and nil. So nil is basically no command means uh, do nothing special. Um, it's basically the same here when we move. We're also returning the model and nil. Uh, when we return t.quit, for example, that's a signal for the bubble t library to terminate the program. Now, as you can see here, I'm calling init on model. That is actually a method I defined myself. It's not the init method from bubble t that we discussed shortly where we are not doing anything. And I did that to have a way to reset our model. So if we don't do that, um, the player is restarting the game, then we still have our old state in the model. So we still have all those items. We still have the player's position, the enemies and so on. But we want to make sure that it's actually a fresh state, a fresh model with a new board. So I basically extracted some stuff from our new model function, our constructor function. You can see here it's the spawning of the player and the drawing of the borders, the four corners that's extracted here. And what I added is to clear all the rest. So we are clearing and resetting all the fields. You can see here I'm creating a new two-dimensional array that is initialized with zeros before I add the borders and so on. I'm also setting the player row and column to zero, the score to zero, and of course, when we start a new game, game over is false again. So this is responsible to actually uh, reset the model to an initial state. We could also create a new model. That's probably an alternative option, but I found this to be the uh, simpler way in this case. So if you if you adapted it to use a new model, then feel free to, to tell me how you did it. Okay, and then the init function, it's called um, here instead of the new model, constructor function that we had before that it's basically similar and we can also call it here when enter is pressed so that resets our state our model and then everything begins from the start so that's it about the score and the restart of the game now finally let's come to the interesting part, which is to make the enemies move. So it's actually a bit more of a challenging game. Okay, so this is our final step. As you can see, once there are enemies, they are also moving. They are moving randomly from their current position and basically synchronously with my player moving. So each time I press an arrow key here and move in one direction, they also try to move in one direction unless they want to move yeah, against the border or item, then of course they, they can't and they will try again to find an 
empty cell. Okay, how does it look like in our code? Um, we can basically reuse the random free coordinates as we already did for spawning enemies. But now we also have to make sure that um, those enemies are moving when my player is moving. So there is a move enemies method here, which is the most important part. It looks a bit complicated, but let's break it down. It's not that difficult. So first, what is move enemies doing? You can see I am calling it when my player moved. So as you have seen, um, if I press up, down, left or right, my player moves and then all the enemies need to move. So not just the first one that we're spawning, but also 10 enemies if we already collected many items. That's where we are calling it. And uh, now we need to basically go over our table. So we're iterating here over all rows and all columns and find each cell where there's an enemy. If there's no enemy, we don't have anything to do, right? So we're checking if at this specific location at this cell that we're currently at, if there's an enemy, we do that for every column and every row combination. So we checked all the cells because there can be many enemies. So we're going to move each enemy randomly to one of the four directly neighboring cells. So each enemy can go uh, left, right, up or down from its current position. And how did I implement that? I basically have this two dimensional other array here, which is called neighbors. Also, it represents the four options that the enemy has. Um, there's the top neighbor cell, the right, the bottom and the uh, left. So actually that is, here's a copy and paste error. This is the right one and column minus one. This is the left neighbor. Fix it. <laughs> okay. These are the four options and they contain the coordinates. So we have four arrays. Each array has two elements, which contains the row, it's the first element and the column. And again, you guessed it, now we just randomly need to pick one of those four. So again, I'm using the standard Go function random integer, um, passing the length of neighbors. So I get a random integer between zero and four exclusive. So it can be zero, one, two, or three. And then I got the target row, which is the first and the target column, which is the second element in the array. So again, in case you didn't quite get it yet, the random index is going to give me one of those lines here. And each of them has two integers in it, which is the row and the column of the neighboring cell. And the first one is then our target row. The second one is our target column. That's what I'm assigning here to the variables. And now what do we have to do? We have to check what is there in this randomly chosen neighboring cell. Is there an enemy? Or is there a player? If there's a player, then of course the game is over. So we mark this Boolean flag game over as true. We return from the 
function because we don't need to update every uh, other cell which may contain enemies. The first enemy that hits us basically kills us, so we can return immediately here. So the, the for loops that you're seeing, they are immediately terminated and the function ends. That's the one case that we need to handle. We hit the player. The more common case is, of course, there's an empty cell. So we basically move the enemy to the empty cell and the game continues. So the table is updated. Um, target row, target call, those are the randomly chosen coordinates of the neighboring cell. They now contain our moved enemy. And the old one is still row and column here. The loop variables, we clear that. So the old position, the enemy is no longer there. So it's empty. And note that we are not returning here. So the loop is continuing to the next cell. We do that for every cell because potentially every cell could contain an enemy. Or almost every cell. And that's it. So iterate over all rows and columns, basically all cells. Check if there is an enemy. If there is an enemy, pick randomly one of the four neighboring cells, top, right, bottom or left. And then update our state, which is the table, move our enemy that we found there, clear the old position and go to the next cell, check if there's an enemy and so on, until we did it for every cell. And that's it. Um, so that is the move enemies function. We didn't change anything else, I guess. Let's see, um, random free coordinates did not change. Yeah, I've simplified it a bit by um, extracting the empty constant. So before that we used um, zero, but here I introduced, yeah, we, we already had this before, we already had the empty uh, symbol, but I simplified it a bit by now filling every uh, empty cell with this. So now it's no longer the zero value, but actually here in it you can see initially every cell is set to empty. And why did I do that? I could also use the zero value, which is the zero integer. I just did that to simplify the uh, model rendering a bit. So you can see further down below, mm, our update function did not change. So view is now very basic. I don't even have to check what's in that cell. I can just say print that model. That's why I uh, switched from zero to this blank. You just have to make sure that it's initialized and when we reset the game after restart that every empty cell is initialized with the blank symbol. So that was a small simplification. And that's about it. The rest did not change. So finally, um, remember the basics. Bubble T, a really great library for console interfaces. It's not specifically for games, like console games. I just used it for that purpose. You can build console-based user interfaces for this, like when you want to be, uh, create a terminal application. So you have to have a model that you create initially, then you start this T program and you run it until there's an error or um, something else. Uh, we implemented these basic functions, which is view that is just creating a string, uh, which bubble T prints on the terminal. And then there's update for reacting to events typically a key events or something else. In it, maybe I'm going to show it in another tutorial. It's not really a use case for us here, but we need to implement it to fulfill this interface that Bubble T expects. And 
the rest is our game or logic. Yeah, that's specifically to our game. I highly recommend Bubble Tea, check it out. I was really uh, amazed by this library. You can do a lot more for you, really impressive terminal interfaces with colors and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, our game is a bit um, simple in this case. You could tune it and make it more colorful or use better um, icons and symbols and things like that. So I hope you liked it. Um, check out the links in the description. You can find the full source code. Maybe you want to build it yourself for learning or for fun. Maybe you just want to play the game in this case. <laughs> tell me what you like about it. And more importantly, tell me your max score. I think I got a bit over 20 points, maybe 25 or something like that, 25 enemies. And then at some point it's really a lot and you can't really uh, move around without getting hit. Maybe you want to extend it. We could add the timer here to make it more challenging, like stop the time, and that is going to influence the score that you get too. And yeah, if you liked it, tell me what you liked or tell me what you want to see more of in the future in terms of tutorials. And uh, see you next time.